It's a bit of a tragic irony that Simon was fighting against casualisation and casualisation was what killed Simon. 47,000 major injuries at work in two years and 500 deaths. These people are not even going to be prosecuted. Well, one of my best friends has been murdered, and so yet there's been no justice for him, his family or anybody. So, until we get justice, we'll keep fighting. What do you not know your mate? It's not acceptable to kill your employees just to keep your profits up. It was working with me in the old of the ship as a stevedore. He'd never worked on a commercial ship before in his life. As far as I'm concerned, he shouldn't have been there. The grab had come down lower than it usually does, but I've seen it low before, so it didn't really bother me. You know, I just got in and got the job done. And I got three hooks on, and the fourth hook had fallen down the opposite side of the back to where I was standing. So as I leant over for it, Simon passed it up. And as I took it off him, I heard him grunt, looked up, and he was dead. The grab had closed. You know, and it wasn't until I actually stood back that I looked straight into Simon's eyes and realised that the grab was where his head should be. Sorry. It was a lovely Friday evening. Then I got home. I don't know, about half past nine. And I just sat down, got a drink, and the phone went. I thought it was some sort of cold caller. And this voice said, Mrs. Jones has asked me to inform you that Simon was killed this morning. And that was, that was just it. And um, I couldn't understand what was happening. We were all very, very fond of him. I remember him being born when Catherine was just three years old. And uh, we grew up as a sort of extended family. He was really intelligent and well-read. And his sense of humour, he had a wicked sense of humour. I got to know Simon when he was coming to work in uh, Fish Snoods. So I'd always be paging him and begging him to come in and, and do some writing because his sort of sarcastic style of writing really fitted in with Schnees' style. He had a sort of dry sense of humour. And also, yeah, very lazy, as far as I can make out, <laughs> trying to get to do some work. Simon had a great time in Brighton, I think. He had a really good life, really good social life, lots of friends. He'd be known as Smiley Sai, that was Simon, this kind of friendly, happy bloke. I needed someone to move into my flat as a lodger, and he did. And within about a week, we'd kind of fallen in love, and uh, that was how I knew him. And he was a really, really major part of my life. I've known him a heck of a long time, really. He's just a lovely mate, really. He's, when Simon died, I think part of, you know, me, well, you do, you die. You die with him, because all of that, you know, he's, he's you a part of you has gone you know, and that will never be the case. In those first few days we had absolutely no idea of the actual horrific way in which Simon had been killed. We accidentally met Sean Curry who'd been working with him that day and he was the first person who told us that Simon had actually been decapitated by the grab of the crane. The story of a gander on fool and the penny actually dropped yeah. that someone was responsible for this. He was put into a ship to do that job with absolutely no training, with a, with a crane driver that couldn't see him, no walkie-talkies, uh, the, the person that was guiding the crane didn't speak a word of English and didn't know proper hand signals and he wasn't even wearing a hard hat. Sean Curry, who'd been working with him, was told to wipe Simon's blood and brains off a bag of, of aggregate so that they could be sold on. And when Sean Curry refused to do that, he was sent home for the day without pay. The manager of Euroman, James Martell, has never so much as sent one line of condolence to Simon's family for what happened. He was negligent and he should be responsible. It's not acceptable to kill your employees just to keep your profits up.
We went down to Uramin um, Port where Simon died on what would have been his 25th birthday. We locked the gates and we talked to all the workers and said while we're doing the action. And people got on the cranes and put banners down. There's a few of us went up the lighting towers there, which are about 100 foot high, and I can remember I, I went up one of those. It was, I was really, really proud of myself. Well, I don't think anything but this issue could have possibly persuaded me to do anything that scary. We occupied the dock and refused to leave until all of the workers have been sent home that day on full pay. And for us, that was a very important point because all the workers there are casual workers. So I think that's probably the first paid day's holiday that they've ever had from the Uramin. It was his birthday. He would have been celebrating. We would have been celebrating on that day. We all felt that we'd achieved something um, in Simon's memory. That sort of brought home to you the scale of the uh, feeling and the support that we had from people in Brighton. And I think it was round about then that you felt, yes, you know, perhaps we can do something about this, perhaps we haven't got to sit back and take it. Simon was under quite a lot of pressure um, to find work. He was, he was actually taking a year off from university and was signing on. He was told that if he didn't find work, he was likely to lose his benefit. Simon was sent to work at Uniman, the Personnel Selection and Employment Agency in Brighton that Simon went to. They were clearly breaking the law. They, they, they failed to make sure that the place that they sent Simon to work was safe. They failed to give him written terms and conditions telling him the sort of work that he was being sent to. And yet they were quite happy to take half his wages. We decided that we would then also target personal selection because they were equally responsible for what had happened. We went in and uh, we told the manager and the staff what we were doing. We weren't violent or anything. We hung a banner out the window. We had people outside leafleting. And we wanted the office closed for the day, closed out of sympathy. We, got, we had a press release which we faxed to all the people they use, telling them what had happened to Simon. We were ringing the media up from their phone lines and stuff. The, the police turned up, but I think the police were pretty wary of arresting us, you know, they hadn't arrested anyone on the death of Simon, so were well, they going to arrest us for protesting about his death? We have tried all the other routes, we have tried speaking to MPs, we did send a letter explaining uh, what the campaign was about and what we wanted to every single MP. Um, I think about half of them responded, we didn't get a good response from the local MPs. Being polite, writing the letters. Maybe at the end you, you'll gnaw and gnaw away and get somewhere. We haven't got the time for that. We need something doing before so many more lives are lost. This is going to carry on until directors and managers are put in the dock and made to answer for their actions. There was a, a very lengthy and thorough police investigation into Simon's death. And despite that, and despite the evidence that we thought was fairly overwhelming, or certainly enough to be put before a jury, the, the Crown Prosecution Service have consistently refused to prosecute anyone in connection to Simon's death. If there's not going to be a prosecution for corporate manslaughter in this case, what case is there going to be where the CPS will decide to prosecute? Simon cannot be brought back. But we would have some consolation if we weren't dealt the final insult that these people are not even going to be prosecuted. The main aim of the campaign is to get justice for Simon. A spin-off aim is to fight casualisation at work. We started off with, you know, a post office box number and some leaflets which, which really got a lot, some media interest and then it just started to snowball really. So where precisely is New Labour? We've had ridiculous amounts of media coverage. It seems to have really rung a bell with the world's media. Um, like the other day we had OK Magazine ringing up for information. 
I mean, we knew that we were right, and we knew that people would care, but we didn't realise how big it was going to be, and the website had a really useful way of, of just easing that process, really. I just said, oh, well, you know, I might be able to set up a website, which was, you know, I was talking rubbish, really, because I, sort of, you know, I thought I might be able to, but I didn't really know if I could. Yeah, and I found out how to do it, and I did it. It's been really useful. We've got a lot more contacts via our e internet site. We've linked with a lot of other campaigns, which has been really helpful. We've had a lot of support via the website. There was a debate in Parliament about Simon's death, and um, so we decided to go up outside Parliament, uh, make a bit of noise. We are here to demand justice for Simon and to demand, demand an end to casualisation that is putting the lives of hundreds of thousands of people at risk every day. Judge Gallery. Simon was no dock worker. Driven by the job seekers allowance scheme, he was sent to his death by a company called Personnel Selection. This company undoubtedly failed in its statutory duty to ensure their client's suitability. They sent him to the docks and into the hands of a cowboy company called Euromin. Euromin and its blood-stained general manager, James Martel, must stand trial for the negligence which caused his death. Here's George Galloway making to me the most important speech that I would ever hear, uh, with hardly an MP to listen to it. Well, one of my best friends has been murdered, and so yet yeah, there's been no justice for him, his family, or anybody. So, until we get justice, we'll keep fighting for Simon, for all those other people dying and getting injured at work. We're asking the Department of Trade and Industry to prosecute personnel selection for their failure to ensure that we're sending them to a safe workplace. They didn't do it, and yet the DTI refused to do anything about that. We think that's a disgrace. About 20 of us piled into the Department of Trade and Industry. Someone must have slipped and hit a fire alarm, and uh, all the three, four hundred civil servants they had to pile outside, which gave us a chance to speak to them and tell them why we're here to leaflet them. I came out of the House of Commons fully expecting to see them all there and there was no one at all. So I rang somebody's mobile to ask where they all were and they informed me that they were inside the offices of the Department of Trade and Industry. Well, I stood outside with a banner. I was like the outside president. <laughs> Someone dived down and tied all their shoelaces up together. And when they tried to run after us, they realised that all their shoelaces were tied up. <laughs> and we might have made a lot of noise and stuff like that, but we've always had leaflets and we've always been able to explain. And nine times out of ten, people are very sympathetic, you know. Excuse me, what comment do you have on the proceedings today? Police sources of see the direct, direct action being taken at the DTI and, you, and I'm a firm believer now that you've got to force people to listen to you. How, what would you do if nothing was happening? You know, direct action is the best way to make a noise in this country. After Simon was killed, the health and safety executive put a prohibition notice on the crane that killed, killed him that basically meant put restrictions on how the crane could be used. Well, we heard and we had evidence that, that this prohibition notice, which is a legal notice, was being breached. So we rang the health and safety officer with responsibility for you, Roman, to tell her about this. I'm sorry, but you, you're wasting an awful lot of my time with this. I've been there, I have looked, I have watched, I have checked as often as I can. That prohibition notice is not being breached. And you can see what's going on from the far side of the harbour. Well, the health and safety executive... Uh, useless, you know. I d I, what's the point in having them if they won't actually prosecute people who have been, who've killed people at work? 
you ask questions or try and find answers, uh, find out why things are happening the way they're doing, and you, it's like hitting a brick wall. Your your opinion on your own doesn't count. You have to all stand together, otherwise you won't achieve anything. We went along and met people from Brighton. My sister and placed a wreath at the Health and Safety Executive, and then and then we took the bridge over. Put a huge banner across the road. There's very few of us, and this is an incredible thing. It can't have been really much more than 30 or 40 people. But between us, with a big enough banner, we just walked out onto the bridge and stopped the traffic. As a member of the public, you have actually no access to the head of the health and safety exam. You cannot communicate with her at all, unless you block, block the bridge <laughs> outside <laughs> the building. <laughs> and then you can speak to her. Eventually. Jenny Bacon succumbed to the pressure to actually meet us in the lobby of the Health and Safety Executive. She said to Anne, Simon's mum, but why, don't, why didn't you write to me? And that's when she totally contradicted herself. She said, I don't read letters from the general public. Simon was fighting against casualisation. Um, in the Liverpool docks dispute, and that was casualisation was what killed Simon. I never really grasped what the Liverpool dockers were about until they came down and talked to us. And it is about casualisation. It's about the fact that people with skilled jobs who are trained to do them, you know, responsibly, are being sacked and replaced with people who have got no training. We contacted them and explained that Simon had been, you know, a real supporter of theirs. It was a tragedy that was waiting to happen. What we, what we forecast back in uh, 95 and up to 98 when, when our dispute finished is coming through. And what we were in our dispute about um, was basically cowboy firms like trying to implement, uh, encroach onto the docks. People are getting brought in off the streets or from pubs or from agencies or from wherever. Right? They, they're like flotsam, they're just coming and going. No one knows who they are. It just reverted right back to the old days, or the bad old days, as they used to call them. Once you start to lose health and safety in any industry, you know, you, you lose, you're starting to lose uh, young people. If you, if you don't have protection for your workers through unions, you don't have all the training, people are going to start dying. People started ringing up the office and saying, my son or my daughter was killed at work. Over the last two years that there's figures for, there's reckoned to have been 47,000 serious accidents at work. 500 deaths or what? Until people see that they're actually going to be prosecuted and they will get sent down, then the company directors will do nothing as long as these people can get away with killing people because mm. it's cheaper to do that <coughs> than to actually enforce health and safety, they will do. On September the 1st, 2000, Simon's 27th birthday that should have been we held a street party outside the Crown Prosecution Service. This is like a hill, isn't it? After six months from judicial review, they still haven't come to a decision on whether or not to prosecute you. I think it's just so unfair that nothing happened, that people have to stand up to get justice. I'm delighted to see so many people turn up. Simon would have been very pleased, as I say. He loved the party. We were pretty surprised at the police response. They were pretty heavy and didn't really give an inch. And ended up arresting someone, which was pretty ironic, given that we were there asking that someone be arrested over Simon's death. It took three and a half years, constant effort, meetings, telephone calls, letter writing, direct action, work from the legal team, to get the case to court. James Martel was charged with manslaughter, Euromin Limited with corporate manslaughter, and Euromin Limited also with three health and safety charges. We were aware that the odds were stacked against us. Euromin were found guilty on two of the 
health and safety charges and not guilty on the third one, which is baffling. The jury found James Martel not guilty of manslaughter and that meant that the case against Euromin for corporate manslaughter collapsed because uh, the, the, the two are bound together. When we heard the foreman of the jury say not guilty, our hearts sank because we'd hoped against all the odds that we would get a guilty verdict. A case like this illustrates with remarkable clarity the total lack of protection offered to workers by present legislation. Having heard the judges summing up, it was severely unbalanced. He paid far more attention to the defence side than to the prosecution side. We feel very, very cynical about the way that, uh, the way that court case went, but not surprised. Uh, the, the politicians and, and the legal people can be very stubborn but um, we and Simon's friends in Brighton can be more stubborn. We haven't forgot about Simon, you know, we're, we're carrying on the campaign. I don't know where everyone's found the strength from and uh, it does sort of motivate me to keep, keep fighting. When we got letters of support from the South Pole, we knew that we'd reached the parts that other campaigns don't reach. We're not going to give up. The press is going to continue with our direct action campaign and we'll continue taking direct action until Simon gets justice and the truth about casualisation gets exposed. This is Queen's Park, which is just around the corner from uh, the squat that Simon was living in when he died. And he really liked it here. We had a tree planted here in his memory and we also scattered his ashes here. He always believed that people were more important than the profits and it was something that you know he talked about and worked for you know a lot as a young man and there's not a lot you can do in 24 years. So Simon, Simon, if he is up there anywhere looking down this will be loving it. He will be really, really impressed. I mean it embodies everything I think that he believed in in terms of standing up for your mates when something goes wrong, but also for, for justice and, and what's right 